When an athlete's in such strong form, it's very hard call to ask them to sacrifice for a team. Being a mother has helped me with cycling in so many ways. Well, today I wanted a result for myself and I went for it. You're listening to the cycling podcast Femina with Ola Shenui and Richard Moore. Supported by Rowan King Coaching and Rafa. What's your name? Roisin. And how old are you? Eight years old. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. I heard you saying it was the best day ever. Yeah. Yeah, what did you enjoy most? When all the ladies were cycling, it it looked really cool. Do you want to do it yourself one day? Yeah, maybe. So quite exciting having the race come through your village like that. Yeah, really, really exciting. what's, What's your name? Uh, Sarah. How old are you, Sarah? Um, 11. And do you have, have you had a good day? Yeah. What did you enjoy most? I, I like seeing, like, just all of them coming up. And what are you, sur- this is a very steep hill that we're on, isn't it? Were you yeah. surprised how, how strong they look going past? Yeah. Yeah, they're going really quick and I could not do that. It's just, like, amazing how they can do that. Are you, uh, do you cycle yourself? Do you think you'd be inspired to take up cycling? Uh, yeah. I think you might take part in the women's tour one day yourself? <laughs> I don't know. But... What's your name? Emily. How old are you, Emily? I'm nine. What was the best bit for you? Um, when they were cycling and was all sharing them. Have you ever seen a cycle race before? Um, no. no. So you'll remember this day for a while? Yeah. It's been better than school? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Cycling Podcast Femina. I'm Richard Moore and I am again with Orla Shinoui. I was wondering if you were waiting for me to say that. Uh, Yes, hello Richard. You can say it if you want. (laughs) You've done it perfectly well, thank you. Back at Orla's house, no energy balls today. (laughs) Oh, I ate them all. Didn't have time to pick any more. That explains it. (laughs) You've enjoyed some of my very special coffee concoction though. I don't know what you're complaining about. Yeah, this, uh, what what was the coffee? It It was coffee with butter and coconut oil, which gives you an almighty boost and is nowhere near as vile as it sounds. I'd highly recommend it. You also told me that it was a very good way of losing weight <laughs> as, you, as, as you handed me a white magnum. <laughs> you did say after scraping half of that magnum off the grass because it fell through the picnic table <laughs> that um, you could feel the weight coming off already. It's off. You probably don't recognise me. Um, listen, <laughs> Can't see you. We're, we're here to talk about women cycling, not, not, not you know what I've been eating. Um, but we have to say a big thank you to everybody for the very uh, kind response to episode one, uh, which came out last month and uh, seemed to be really well received. So we were pretty pleased about that. Um, this is a monthly podcast. This is episode two. Episode three will be next month. <laughs> and uh, and we've got fairly straightforward. Yeah, it's really really simple. Um, we have to thank Rowan King Coaching for uh, sponsoring the cycling podcast Femina, and also Rafa, who have come on board as overarching sponsors of the cycling podcast and so they are sponsoring this episode as well thank you very much to them for for making it possible so we've got lots to talk about in this episode lots of interviews as well in the first part we're going to speak about the women's tour uh, which i was at and we've got a, a some interviews with and about Marianne Voss, who sort of made her comeback there to, on, to the big time. And we'll also hear from Wiggle High Five manager Rochelle Gilmore and her teammate Elisa Longo Bargini. Quite an interesting uh, couple of interviews with them from the Women's Tour. And then in part three, Orla? Yeah, in part three, I've been chatting to an absolutely inspirational rider, Scotty Lechuga, an American uh, rider who is one of the very few pro cyclist who manages to juggle professional cycling with motherhood. She has not one but two children, um, twins, who she takes on the road with her an awful lot of the time and her husband and they sort of travel as a merry band on the road to support her in her cycling career. It was great just to chat to her and find out her story and how she manages to juggle that. And I think there's a lot that maybe some of our listeners can identify with just trying to fit everything in when um, you've got screaming kids at your door. But yeah, she was fantastic. Did your phone go off during that? My phone did, it's yes. such an amateur. I know, I Although know. Although very professional the way you just carried on regardless. <laughs> That's me. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, listen, I was at the women's tour. I know you watched a lot of it, a mm. lot of it too. Lizzie Armit said was a winner in the last episode. Uh, I think I confidently predicted that she wouldn't win. <laughs> or she certainly was playing down her chances. I think she was going into it with a very open mind, unsure where her form was. 
Uh, but she was a very, very good winner. It was a much harder women's tour than previous years. The women themselves had asked for tougher, more selective stages. And we saw on stage three in particular to Chesterfield, which went through the Peak District and through Matlock. I was standing on Bank Road in, in Matlock. Very, very steep, straight up climb. Horrible, horrible climb. Um, in fact, we heard at the start of the episode from some of the, mm. the school children who were standing on Bank Road uh, watching the, the riders come through. And I was saying right at the point, in fact, where Ashley Moman attacked behind the, the breakaway and took with her uh, Longo Borghini. And Armistead sort of followed at a distance. She, she seemed to be very carefully managing her effort and not going too deep, but keeping them within touching distance. And she bridged the gap over the top and, and then won the stage into Chesterfield and looked strong, not perhaps the strongest on the climbs. I think Moolman Passio, as she's, as she's known now, uh, was the strongest on the climbs. But Armistead was a very convincing winner. Yeah, and I think that was a key moment, I think, showing us all what her intentions are and, and what her form is really at this stage before the Olympic Games. Because... Um, we were all playing a bit of a guessing game, I think, there. We were trying to work out whether Lizzie was um, deliberately keeping something in the bag or whether she just couldn't quite keep up. And she showed us exactly what she was doing, managing her efforts incredibly well to then go on and win the stage in, in such style and win the overall race. And I perhaps foolishly suggested in the last episode that her turning up might be enough for the crowds and, and by implication that would mean it would be enough for her and that she might be saving something in reserve, you know, at this stage before the Olympic Games. Well, she showed us exactly what the rainbow bands mean to her, exactly what home racing means to her and also just what her form is. It was fantastic to see and she's looking very difficult to beat and, yep, she might not have won in outstanding form but there wasn't really anyone coming close was there and I think she's going to be the rider to beat in she, Rio. She looked pretty confident uh, and I mentioned at the start another rider who we saw return to the sort of winning at world tour, tour level after a very difficult year and a bit was Marianne Voss the Dutch woman used to be completely dominant mm. for years in the sport of course and she's been slowly getting back to full health and uh Results have been improving. She rode well at Flesh Wallone in April, but I think the women's tour, which she won a couple of years ago, the first edition, was a, was the first real indication that she she's back to close to her previous form. Still lacking a little bit in the climbs, but um, she won a, a fantastic stage four again as the previous as in the previous day. Longo Borghini, Moolman, and uh, Armistead were clear. Emma Johansson was with them, but they were the strongest riders in the race, really, when, when the roads were tough. And Voss just about single-handedly brought them back mm. and then won the stage really, really well. So, you know, I'm not sure what it all says about her chances for the Olympic Games. I think her climbing is still isn't back to where it should be, but she looks in very confident, very good form. And I uh, took the opportunity at the Women's Tour to speak to her. Unfortunately, I spoke to her in Chesterfield just after she she lost the Helen Jersey, so probably the worst day to speak to her. But she was she was okay. Uh, I bet I spoke to her. We'll hear from her in a moment. Also spoke to her her longtime teammate Roxanne Kinetman, uh, daughter of the late Jerry Kinetman, who was a, a very good Dutch cyclist way back when. Spoke to Roxanne, who's ridden with Marianne Voss uh, since they were teenagers. In fact, they were they were rivals as teenagers. They're teammates now. And I spoke to her DS and her parents, who follow her around with the pet cat in a camper Aww. van. So they had the pet cat out on a on a lead and uh, I, I tried to interview the cat as well didn't get <laughs> didn't get a lot of sense out of the cat not the worst interview I've ever done I'm sure, sure there have been many admit. worse <laughs> my, my interview with like, Emma Pooley was actually less successful but <laughs> anyway we'll get on to that later um, let's hear, let's from, hear from the cat from a few of the, a, a cast of people and animals around <laughs> Marianne Voss I'm Hank Voss the father of Marianne Voss so here you are in your camper van in Ashbourne with the Jackie, cat? Jackie, Jackie the cat. Jackie the cat. How, how old is Jackie? Famous cat is five years now. Almost as famous as Marianne. Yeah, almost, yes. Yeah. How many yeah. races do you get to go and see? M- most all of them. Not all, but most all of it, yeah. yeah. You, you've been here the last couple of years. Marianne has obviously won this race before. You seem to get a lot of attention here in Britain. <laughs> yeah, you could say that it's yeah, a lot of attention and people know us and shake hands and yeah, it's, it's nice. 
Uh, Marion is obviously in the yellow jersey now. Very difficult the last year to see her not be able to train and, and race and have questions and doubts about her health. Yeah, that is a difficult time. Uh, Were there moments where you wondered, doubted whether she would come back to the top? Yeah, that was, it was possible. That was uh, difficult for us. Face, yeah, a, a yeah. quick word with the cat? Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe easy, but it's now too busy um, to, to see. He's this. looking out for Marion, is he? Yeah. Is, yeah. is, is, is it Marion's cat? Does the cat live yeah. with Marion? Uh, it's uh, the family cat. It's family the family cat, cat yeah. yeah, man. The cat was also in England with the Olympics. Oh, really? Yeah, so yeah, the cat yeah. has been a lucky charm then. <laughs> yeah. Been there for a all of Marion's success. A lot of attention for her. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah this is speci- especially. <laughs> I'm Marion's mother. And I hope she will back on the top. Everything she, she can do for it, she does. Is she going to win an Olympic gold medal in Rio, do you think? Uh, maybe. <laughs> She's hoping so. Every day, of every race, when I race with her, she is better. So that's, that's good to see. I think uh, we, are, uh, we will hear a lot more uh, of her. Uh, you, you saw the first races she do, uh, she was not that self-confident. So she don't know uh, how her body reacts. And you saw it in the first training camp. It goes two days really well and then uh, three days out. And it's it like this all the time. You know, we know what she can do. And uh, when her body will work normally, she, she can do it. But yeah, you also have to believe in it. And I think this, this is the first race I do in a few weeks with her. That's our confidence. That is back. She knows, okay, I can do this. And... Uh, she feels really good, and, and I think that's the most important thing for Rio. I think the whole, whole thing, what's happened, it, it makes her maybe a better uh, a total person, I think. And uh, yeah, she has the jersey now, and we not give it away that easy, so uh, we go fight for it. And uh, when uh, we know Marianne, it will be a hard battle. Finally, Roxanne, because we're getting rained yeah, on here. It's raining. <laughs> um, can she? This is the final question. Can she win an Olympic gold medal in Rio? <laughs> uh, we have uh, also Anna van der Breggen for that, of course. Yeah, we, we have to see. Um, it's a really, really hard course. And uh, when you have a head like Marjan, then I, I, when you look in her head, I think yes. But uh, on that hard course, uh, look to the, the other girls. I think yes, but uh, I also give uh, a lot of money on Anna van der Brecha. I'm Koos Moerenhout, I'm sport director of uh, the Rabo Lift team, uh, which means I'm also uh, supporting Marianne. It must be great to see her get back to winning ways. Yeah, of course, it's, uh, she came a long way. And uh, yeah, if you see her development, it's constant, she's, she's far from there yet. Uh, we have to be ris- realistic about it, um, but uh, she's getting better and better. And she can handle uh, more and more training, she can handle more and more racing. So that's a good sign and that's positive. And uh, she could take the lead yesterday, uh, doing a good job. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's just plain good. And uh, yeah, from now on, we continue what, uh, and see what happens. Has, she, has her progress been, been quicker uh, than, than perhaps you? and she expected well with what she has been gone through uh, yeah it's it's it, uh, every prediction is uh, is difficult uh, you have to wait and see and constantly adjust the program or adjust the training and I think uh, that has been done quite well and yeah and, and you it's it's already a big difference between Mariana in, in February for instance and Mariana now uh, Mariana in February is very very fragile uh, still it's getting better and better but of course the the, the top edge the the last thing it's that that's also uh, very difficult of course that last part but uh, yeah we're aiming for that now how important though is it for her mentally psychologically and for her confidence to you know, to be to be back at the front of the race, um, up there on the stages, leading the race overall. Now, was she was she in pretty good spirits last night? Uh, well, knowing Marianne, if she doesn't win, she's not happy. <laughs> so that's uh, she's very critical uh, of herself. But yeah, in the end, for, oh, definitely, she's a champion. Uh, but even uh, the ch- uh, the champions of champions, they need uh, also confirmation of their. Uh, condition. Uh, every good step is uh, also a good step for the mo- motivation. You don't want to get carried away because I know one of the problems she's had has been, you know, feeling good one day and then slipping back again the next. I guess you'll be watching her carefully to make sure that that you know that she just keeps a sort of consistency of performance. 
Yeah, that's it. Uh, we are uh, very positive, but we are also realistic and uh, take it day by day and we'll see what happens. And of course, we try uh, to do our best here. And uh, if she could win the race, that would be great. Uh, women's cycling is stepping up uh, with more numbers, uh, more riders who can win races. So that's that's only positive. And uh, for her now, it's yeah getting back back to the position she wants to be in. And uh, yeah, at this, uh, this point, she's yellow, so we cannot complain. Was it a case, do you think, that she, she tried to do too much? And will that affect, you know, what she does in the next couple of years? That she'll maybe try and just be a bit more conservative? She has to. She has to. She has to pick the moment. And then she can still have great wins. I'm pretty sure about that. Physically, mentally, she knows how to read the races. Super strong in the head. And of course, uh, yeah, uh, also physically, she's she's super strong. And yeah, good on the road, good on the track, good on mountain bike, uh, good on cyclocross. Sometimes her worst enemy is her own mind. Determination to prove it each day and every day and that uh, brought her of course uh, where she is now uh, with all uh, all the results all the victories all the wins all the world titles uh, olympic titles it can also be uh, your downfall the, the now you can still see in women's cycling uh, the one who's going to win uh, tour flanders can also win flash Wallon can also win basically every race in women's cycling that's not possible in, in, in men's cycling. Uh, that's, uh, you have really specialization, like uh, part of the team is aiming for that kind of races, part of the team is aiming for that kind of races. And if the, the, the uh, women's sport is developing and keeps on developing the way it is now and uh, that will continue, then at one point it will be like that also. And it will be much harder for uh, riders like Marianne, like Pauline Frampravo to, to combine all disciplines. So if Marianne was to do one thing and focus on one type of race what would it be i think she needs to follow her heart and that uh, and what she likes to do the best and uh, she loves the most and and that's uh, that's that, that's basically giving a shitty answer because she loves everything <laughs> that will not make her life much easier i guess but she has to plan carefully and that's what i have been telling her already for many years and that's not uh, been the best part of uh, of her cycling life that that's the only way to approach it that's uh, i'm pretty sure about that you must be delighted with how the race has, has gone so far and to be back in a, a yellow jersey again. Well, yeah. Well, of course, after such a hard stage, the feeling is a little bit different. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a nice and beautiful stage. And I think the, the four best were up front. So it was, uh, it was good. And, well, yeah, tomorrow another race. Are you, I mean, I mentioned that back in a yellow jersey, I, has, I spoke to you a month or so ago and you said at the time that you, know, you were still good one day and not so good the other day. Do you feel that it's changed a lot even in the last month? Yeah, it's getting better and better and the recovery gets better. So uh, that's where I'm very pleased about. And of course, uh, this kind of racing is, uh, well, yeah, it's the highest level you can get. So uh, then to be back uh, racing uh, in front, that's... Uh, it's a good feeling. Well, yeah, what does it feel like? Because it was a while that you didn't experience that. I mean, you must have doubted whether you would again, I guess. So the last couple of days you've been fighting for a stage win. It must have felt pretty good. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I don't think I lost that uh, that winning spirit. <laughs> so uh, that's where, uh, of course, I'm, I've, I've always uh, been aiming for. And I'm happy, happy to be back in that, uh, well, in that play. And I mean, in that game. And uh, yeah. It's uh, it's good to be back here. And uh, aims for the the rest of the race and, and and looking beyond this. Well, yeah, we'll see. Day three, day four coming up tomorrow. It will be uh, pretty tough again. I mean, you're obviously fast. You know, you've been competitive the last couple of days in the sprints. Is it maybe on the climbs that you've still got to get a bit a bit extra back again? Yeah, not a bit. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, but yeah, it's coming. Looking ahead to Rio. I mean, is that something that you allow yourself to think about? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm in the Dutch Dutch team, so uh, that's where I'm trying to prepare for now. And that's, uh, well, yeah, it's coming fast. So we heard there from various people around Marianne Voss, as well as Voss herself. Very interesting comments from the sports director at Rabo Live, Koos Moonhout, former Rabobank rider, um, who, you know, talked a little bit about the challenge of just holding her back a little bit that she wants to do everything and that that's that was her downfall she she's still quite young you know she's not that much older than than lizzie armit said but she raced she was so full on for so long i remember in in 2013 orla you were hosting the the braveheart dinner i think mm-hmm. in scotland she was a special guest she was a, a great value guest actually she was she was terrific 
on the night. But I interviewed her at the time, and she'd been racing mountain bikes that year, and mm. she'd won a gold medal on the track in Beijing in 2008, the gold gold medal in the road race in London. And I think she was in the back of her mind was the idea of going for a gold medal and mountain biking in Rio. And you know, her problem started around then. She just overdid it, and she suffered from overtraining burnout which is a very difficult condition for an athlete to suffer from because there is not a stigma but it's such a vague uh you know it's not like a broken collarbone it's a vague sort of diagnosis that can be very hard to explain to people and even to yourself yeah and it's something that gets under your skin as well doesn't it and that's a big part of winning races is making sure that you have the confidence first of all and also that everyone else is scared of you so if you can't explain what's wrong with you then that makes it very difficult indeed but I think it's quite interesting when you look at her career and when we end up uh, at one stage looking back on her career um, to think that the way she overdid it in some ways was a downfall because I mean you look at her Palmares and it is outstanding you know you say about um, the road race in London and the Olympic Games in Beijing you know it's 10 years since she was the road world champion and cyclocross world champion at the same time and since then the medals have come one after the other after the other and as you say she's not that much older than Lizzie Armitstead um, I was lulled into the misapprehension actually that, that she was quite a bit older just because of, of how much she's won but she's only a year and a half older than Lizzie Armitstead so uh, there's a, there's something to be said for okay that she's overdone things but at the same time regardless of what she does from here on in and that's not going to be any comfort to an athlete who still wants to keep winning but regardless you look back at her career and she has been and still is a phenomenal athlete the likes of which women cycling will struggle to find again despite how much more popular and competitive it's becoming and I think that stands to her credit enormously and the fact that she still wants to win and the fact that she can still win and the fact that despite this mysterious drop in form she is still going to be a contender in, in Rio most likely we're privileged to witness someone of her calibre at the height of her career yeah I mean uh, you know I, maybe a bit un, unkindly I remember I remember watching the the world championship in Florence in 2013 which she won and she'd been a, not quite her best that year but she won it with a, a, another majestic performance very dominant performance and uh, there was a period in women's cycling where I remember thinking if the sport had several Marianne Vosses mm-hmm. it would be it would be very very exciting to watch it be in a very healthy state that's what's happened mm. and so it, it kind of it, you know there are several Marianne Vosses now really um, there are several extremely good riders competing at a high level so it's very difficult for one rider to to dominate and the sport will perhaps not have that superstar and yet mm. ironically be healthier for it yeah and it, she's got that twin problem really doesn't she whereby she has maybe passed her very best well she has probably passed her very best and at the same time the rest of the field has gotten so much better and in a way I guess was she fortunate to be so dominant at a time when there was less competition I think that's probably very unfair to her and and her strength as an all-round athlete but yeah it would be fantastic to see several Mariana Vosses at her level across all the disciplines but you know it's she is a one-off athlete and as you say women's cycling is a stronger healthier and much more interesting sport because of it The cycling podcast Femina, interviews, insight and analysis of women's racing, supported by Rowan King Coaching and Rafa. See rowanking.com for tailored training programmes by Luke Rowe and Danny King. Thank you very much to our sponsors, Rowe and King Cycling Coaching. That, of course, is a training company run by Luke Rowe of Team Sky and Danny King of Wiggle High Five and thank you also to Rafa who sponsor the Cycling Podcast and the Cycling Podcast Femina at the Women's Tour again I spoke to Rochelle Gilmore who runs uh, Wiggle High Five and Elisa Longo Borghini in Chesterfield after that very tough and decisive stage three Longo Borghini was one of the riders up the road with Armistead and, and Ashley Moolman and there was an interesting scenario that sort of unfolded around the Wiggle High Five team bus when I went and spoke to Rochelle and Elisa after the stage. Let's hear from Rochelle Gilmore and then from Elisa Longo Borghini. So Rochelle, we're, we're speaking in Chesterfield, a really quite possibly decisive stage today. It was certainly a very hard stage and you had your Italian uh, Longo Borghini up there and she was third on the stage. Happy with that? 
I'm a little bit confused. I have mixed feelings. I'm very happy for Elisa to um, have tested her legs today and um, obviously she's one of the strongest riders in the world and to be in the break today with uh, Lizzie was definitely uh, good for her confidence and just to gauge a little bit her form going into the Giro d'Italia. But um, for us, I think for the team, it puts us in a very difficult position that we're away in a breakaway with Lizzie Armistead because it'll be very hard now to um, beat her also with such a strong team with Bowles. Uh, it may have been a, a better team tactic to um, ask Elisa to sit on um, today and bring it back when we had three sprinters in the in the bunch to have a sprint and then have everyone still in contention. Because our strength in numbers here is um, really our strength and when you only have one rider in a break with Lizzie Armitstead, I think we've put ourselves in a very difficult position. Were you, is that what you were thinking as you were watching the race unfolding and was there any way to get that message to her? Uh, we've got race radios and we've got um, communication but we're not sure if she was hearing us uh, clearly we haven't had a chance to talk to her yet but um, the race director also wanted to give her personally a, a, an opportunity to decide herself what she wanted to do and um, she did work equal turns all the way to the finish so um, sometimes when a, an athlete's in such, such strong form it's a very hard call to ask them to sacrifice for, for a team when you, you don't know what the team would finish like anyway so um, for her personally that's uh, the decision that she made today to push it all the way to the finish with Lizzie and she feels very very uh, good about the results so um, we'll hear more in the team meeting tonight and talk about whether we think we can actually win the tour or if we have to um, be content with third and, and go for stages. Sometimes in moments like that the earpiece can fall out can't it? <laughs> you, you find out late, later. It can conveniently fall out too but um, yeah um, we, we, um, we don't think we did have clear communication with Elisa today coming into the finish because uh, Georgia Bronzini was also trying to reach her and uh, she's the team captain and in the race car behind the peloton uh, towards the finish we could hear Georgia but we're not sure that uh, Lisa was hearing either the race director or, or Georgia as team captain. And it's very difficult isn't it? A rider, she's, she's not exactly a, a young, you know, inexperienced rider, she's a, a world class rider uh, to, to, for her to be in that position of perhaps sitting on a break, she wouldn't, she wouldn't want to do that would she? Well, she would do it for, for the team, but she's in very good form and only only she can know what form she's in and be able to feel her legs. And I think that she's really feeling confident about her condition right now. And uh, given that, I think with her experience that she, she chose to give it everything and she said that um, she really wanted to have a go at the finish today and um, she did that and not quite the uh, result that she or I, I or the team were hoping for but um, she's confident about her condition going into tomorrow so maybe we'll see more of a, an aggressive Elisa tomorrow. It's interesting you talking there about the tactics and you're very open when it comes to, to that and you know your videos you've been producing as well where you really kind of open the door into the, the workings of the team and the thinking that goes behind it. Is that is that a deliberate thing that you want to give people that insight to, to help them understand the sport a little bit better as well? Yeah, I think that um, the thing is that you engage more with your fans and followers if you show them the inside workings of the team and you open yourself to a lot of um, criticism as well, but it's actually the way that the, the teams run and we like to share that with everyone. It makes it much more difficult for our team to win bike races, um, sharing tactics uh, openly on videos and um, obviously in interviews and things like that, but... Um, you know, this team's a little bit more about um, promoting the sport rather than winning bike races. So there's priorities in the team and we put this team together to lift the professionalism and the level of our sport and um, we believe that sharing everything with our fans and followers and the public will engage them more with what actually goes on in a professional women's cycling team and that's the good with the bad. Obviously, if we win a race, everybody sees it, but um, when you have bad days or you make mistakes, it's, um, you know, some people don't want the world to, to hear you admit that you might have made a mistake, but... Um, you know, it's not, it's not all roses, it's sometimes, you know, thorns and you can take it really hard and um, we share that. So the bigger picture is, is more important. I spoke to you a couple of years ago in Ghent just as you launched the team. This team has sort of grown in parallel with this event, hasn't it really? And, you know, when you look around now and you see the crowds and the standard of racing as well, do you, are you, you must be happy with how things are progressing both for the team and in a wider sense as well. To think that just a few years ago this team didn't exist and neither did the women's tour, tour in Britain um, didn't exist and uh, both the race and our team have come a very long way in the last few years and uh, I think that's due to the professionalism and um, obviously there's no secret that hard work has to go into everything and you see Sweet Spot, they're dedicated, they're passionate and they work hard and um, their, their race shows uh, the results of that and I think that our team team does as well. Um, we, we went to the top in three years, that was our main objective to do that and um, now it's a... I think it's a harder challenge to stay there.
Third on the stage today, very tough stage. Are you happy happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy. Um, I'm I'm here to find uh, the race rhythm, and uh, today I I tried to test my legs, um, and I even tried to honor the race because last year we asked for a, a tougher and a longer stage race, and uh, the organizers. Uh, made it so we tried to to put a, a good show on so you felt the responsibility today almost to perform having requested a you know a tough stage it certainly was a tough stage what did you make of those those climbs um so you know i'm racing for a for an english team uh, we go live five um they are english sponsors so um, i felt like trying to to show the logos and to try to to honor this race, uh, the, the climbs were really tough today. Uh, Mulman was uh, attacking and going deep in uh, into a really steep climb, and then uh, we we took the lead. Now I was speaking to Rochelle, and she said there was a dilemma for you as a team whether you work with Lizzie or not work with Lizzie because you obviously had other options behind what what were your thoughts were you thinking that that was a possibility that you would maybe sit on and allow the race to come back together or once you were in that group were you determined to to help it stay clear well today I wanted a result for myself and I went for it it wasn't a dilemma that you had you didn't think you weren't thinking of alternative scenarios no no um, what now then? I mean, Lizzie's in the yellow jersey. She's obviously in great form. She's been great form all year. Is she beatable? Uh, we have a strong team here and um, we will try to. So we heard there from Rochelle Gilmore and Elisa Longo Borghini from Wiggle High Five. And very interesting. I have a, a difference of opinion there about what the, 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 the right strategy was on that particular stage. I mean, they had riders behind who were, as Rochelle said, faster finishers. If the race had come back together, they might have had a stage win. Longo Borghini was clearly, as the results in the end showed, one of the three strongest riders in the race. She didn't want to sacrifice her chances for the for the team. It would have been a gamble. You know, they might not might have ended up with nothing. Um, so a, a tricky one. But what was more interesting was just the openness of, of Rochelle Gilmore. And, you know, she's been a real breath of fresh air the last couple of years. And more recently, I mentioned the videos. You'll find them on, on YouTube. You'll find sort of behind the scenes. It's sort of like uh, almost like the Orica Green Edge backstage mm-hmm. pass type thing where you get a real, um, you, you, you sit in on team meetings and you can see where things have gone wrong. You can see the, the inquest, the debrief, where it's a level of openness that you don't you don't often get in professional sport. It's a very, very interesting yeah, you certainly wouldn't get it in the men's uh, version of cycling, would you? Um, it's quite amusing, really, from a distance that um, Longo Borghini was so unequivocal there. It was, I'm going for the win, that's it. And and I like, as you say, Rochelle Gilmore's openness. Um, I'm thinking back to 2012, the Tour de France, and Chris Froome, Sir Bradley Wiggins. I can't imagine Team Sky being quite so open and saying we did try to communicate with um, with Chris. He just wasn't listening. Whereas R- Rochelle Gilmore was so um, open there that she was she was giving her a little bit of uh, an excuse, wasn't she? Suggesting, I mean, we're in the Peak District, so that, mm. I asked about the race radio because people have this idea that mm. with race radio you have crystal clear communication. On roads like that, in countryside like that, it often doesn't work. And if it does work, it's just a jumble of noise. You don't hear it. So the communication can be tricky. Um, you know, they were obviously communicating okay with Bronzini. Well, exactly. Was she, in, she wasn't a million miles away, was she? <laughs> so. a, a fast finisher. <laughs> uh, who might have fancied her chances for the stage win, perhaps. Um, you know, yeah, Borg, uh, Longo Borghini wasn't wasn't too far, much further up the road. And it is amazing how often in those scenarios the earpiece does just fall out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or doesn't work. <laughs> well, to go back to what you're saying about about Gilmore and the team strategy, it's very honourable that you know, if indeed that is their case, they're not so bothered about winning bike races. And obviously, it's easy to say that on a day when you haven't won to say, well, actually, it's just as important that we open our doors and make it as transparent as possible to bring the fans on board. And if indeed that is um, on a par for them with winning, then it's fantastic. And that's part of what makes women's cycling that much more interesting, I think, sometimes than men's cycling, dare I say it. Well, because there's more, there's more to talk about. There's more to get your teeth into because the doors aren't closed. No, but th- this is what I think women's cycling has to do, and men's mm-hmm. cycling as well. Open up the doors. Yeah. I mean, some teams in, in men's cycling have done it. I think um, Giant Alpsen have mm. been pretty good over the years in, in letting people in. Um, but it is it is admirable, and it, it is fascinating. It, you know, she said it, co- it cost them races. I, I, 
I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know um, if if that's if that's the case or not. Um, but because you know, the, the, it's not ta- different tactics. They're not sort of um, trade secrets as you were. There's only so many different scenarios mm. you can get in a bike race. Um, but it was tricky and you know difficult for Longo Borghini to have been asked to sit on that move as well because that that wouldn't have made her very popular and there's a sense of honor among bike riders as well especially when she was clearly one of the strongest in the race the right thing to do was to work in that in that group not to sit on um so you know had she followed the instruction if the instruction was given and she'd followed it she wouldn't have made herself very popular the race wouldn't have been as exciting Mm. It would have been sort of nullified and neutralized. Lizzie Armit said would have probably just kept attacking and eventually got away anyway. I, I don't know, but um, that would have been a high, a, a very risky move that would have probably made Wiggle High Five pretty unpopular. Yeah, and it's good to see just some good, honest racing as well, isn't it? You know, tactics are very important, professional. Uh, bike racing but at the same time just getting in there getting stuck into the race is what you really want to see as a fan isn't it and um, you know she was. She said she was honouring the race they asked for a harder women's tour they got a harder women's tour to then sit back I guess and, and take it a little bit easy would be a little bit disrespectful and also just a bit pointless wouldn't it it would be a bit make the request rather disingenuous so um, yeah all, all power to her I say Absolutely. Well, listen, let's wind the clock back, Orla, for the monthly feature from Lionel Burney uh, with a, a look back, a look back in time with uh, Lionel's retro feature. Last month, it was the origins of the Tour de France Femina. What you got for us this month, Lionel? I'm in Granville where stage three of the 2016 Tour de France starts. It's a well-to-do port town in Normandy, birthplace of the designer Christian Dior, and it has a self-styled nickname of the Monaco of the North, although the boats in the harbour are not quite as grand. 30 years ago, in July 1986, the third edition of the Tour de France Feminin started here, with a 2.2 kilometre prologue time trial. It was the second race in a series of five, dominated by the rivalry between an Italian woman, Maria Cannins, and Jenny Longo of France. As we heard in last month's episode, the first edition of the Tour de France Feminin had been won by an American, Marianne Martin, partly because many of the top European riders skipped the race in order to prepare for the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. But between 1985 and 1989, Canins and Longo stood head and shoulders above everyone else, finishing first and second every year, winning stage after stage and dominating the race and building a rivalry that defined the sport's first great golden era. Cannons was already 36 years old when she won her first tour in 1985. She was born in Bolzano, surrounded by mountains, and had already enjoyed a long, successful career as a cross-country skier stretching back to the late 1960s. She'd won multiple Italian titles and in fact continued ski racing in the winters, even as her cycling career took off. The 1985 Tour Feminin was actually split into two parts, a first section of 12 stages and then, after a few days' break, a second race of five stages. Cannons won both sections convincingly and a confusing points classification that combined the results of the two races disguised the fact that she'd beaten Longo by more than 22 minutes. By the time the third Tour Feminin kicked off here in Granville, the race was well established, but it was still struggling to match the Tour de France in terms of media coverage. The fact the two races ran at the same time meant the Tour Feminin received less coverage, and in 86 it was up against one of the greatest tours of all time, the battle between Bernardino and Greg LeMond, although the rivalry between Cannons and Longo was just as compelling. Cannons won that prologue by one second from Longo, And although the French woman got closer overall, she was still more than 15 minutes down at the end of the race. Cannons were just too good in the mountains. She won by six minutes at Serre Chevalier, another two and a half at Le Puy de Dom, and although Longo was strong in time trials, she couldn't recover enough time. But finally, in 1987, Longo got the better of Cannons in the first of two classic and evenly matched editions of the race. Twice the two riders broke away from the rest of the peloton on their own together, It was not until Morzine in the Alps that Cannons finally cracked and lost three minutes, handing Longo her first overall Tour Feminin. By 1988, Longo was married and was now known as Longo Ciprelli. She won five stages to Cannons two that year and clinched the overall by a minute and 20 seconds, which was the closest margin between the pair. 
and in 1989, with age finally catching up with Cannons, Longo was able to crush her great rival and won the tour by 8 minutes 44 seconds, helped considerably by a 3 minute victory in the time trial and clear superiority in the Alps. And that was the end of the Tour Feminin's glory era, with the score Jenny Longo 3, Maria Cannons 2. The race did continue, but it moved from its July slot to September, so it wasn't running alongside the men's race. As a standalone event, it did not enjoy any greater prosperity. It detached from the parent company ASO and continued as the Grand Boucle Feminine until 2009. We'll cover the history of that race in future episodes. Like Cannins, who raced well into her 40s, Longo also had a long career. She won her final World Individual Time Trial title in 2001 when she was almost 43, and her final French Time Trial title at 52. The Cycling Podcast Femina. Interviews, insight and analysis of women's racing. Supported by Rowan King Coaching and Rafa. See rowanking.com for tailored training programs by Luke Rowe and Danny King. Another big thank you to our sponsors, Row and King Cycling Coaching. Look them up if you want personalised training from two of the world's top professionals. As we said last month, it includes a monthly phone call from either Danny King or Luke Rowe. Orla, uh, you did promise last month that you were going <laughs> to sign up. Did I? You were going to sign I? up. Have you, have you done so yet? <laughs> Um, anyway, on to the next section. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and also to Rafa. Thank you to Rafa for their sponsorship of the podcast. We are very proud to call them partners and uh, look forward to a long and fruitful relationship with Rafa. Thank you to them. Don't look at me like that, Orla. Why are you looking at me like that? She's gone all corporate. It's rather, I did. rather beautiful. I, I, I didn't know where I was going there at all. <laughs> it just, words just came out. You did it so easily, as though. Li- as Lionel said, w- would say, words just came out my face. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, we've we've covered a lot of ground in this in this second episode of the Cycling Podcast Feminine. We're already looking ahead to, to next month's episode. We're going to be at the La Course on the final day of the Tour de France, the women's race on the Champs Elysees. Orla, you and I we might, might do some uh, some live reportage there, perhaps. Indeed, yeah. If the mood takes us. Uh, I remember two years ago it was absolutely chucking with rain. The first one. It yeah. Was, I didn't make it last year, unfortunately, because we had the long drive from the Alps and we we didn't get there in time, but. Two years ago, I was there, and there were crashes galore. The rain was torrential. Um, so ho- 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 hoping, hoping, <laughs> my, mouth, my face stopped working there. Um, hoping for better conditions this year, and we'll, we'll speak to some of the riders and so on. Um, be interesting to see who rides it as well with with Rio so close, you know, coming up so close after that. So anyway, we'll be there. We'll have news from the Giro Rosa as well, which. Uh, we're going to be overtaken by uh, with this one. It's it's early July. And we've also got an interview with Becky James in the next episode, which is really interesting, the sprinter uh, who's had a, a terrible time um, with illness, injury, health scares, and is back and uh, and looking forward to Rio. And she's a really interesting athlete, Becky James. Um, so that's a good interview. And uh, we'll have probably lots more besides. But in the final part, You've got an interview for us, Orla. Yeah, speaking of interesting athletes, uh, seamlessly done there. Uh, That's what we're trying to do. (laughs) When we started this, uh, obviously not very long ago, we were chatting, um, me and you, Richard, about what it was about women's cycling that made it slightly different, I guess, from men's cycling and what it was about the sport that attracted women and and the different juggling acts, I guess, that women have to do as opposed to men. Um, and I came across this fantastic rider, Scotty Lechuga, who um, was a domestique for United Healthcare last year and has signed for Hagen's Berman Supermint this year, an American outfit. Um, and Scotty is 33 years old and a mother of five-year-old twin boys. And she was talking me through life for her as a mother and a professional athlete and her story actually before even coming to this level is really interesting because she started um, professional cycling after becoming a mum so she was going through a divorce and just got on some old bike that she had decided she absolutely loved it it gave her a new lease of life um, like many of us who get on bikes as adults I think you just get that f- that sense of freedom that you had as a kid and I think she felt a bit of that uh, then fell pregnant 
and with twins and then decided after that that she still wanted to try to become a professional cyclist. So I was asking her how on earth she manages to juggle all of this. Her little boys uh, got in in the act a few times trying to interrupt mummy as she was chatting to me. Um, but let's hear what she had to say about what life is like on the road as a professional cycling mum. This year, I'm racing for the Hoggins Berman Super Mint women's UCI team, and I feel like that's been a really good choice and a really good fit for me this year personally because they've allowed me to prioritize my family and have allowed for a relaxed environment in terms of bringing my kids to the races and allowing me to spend time with them in the evenings in between stages, and that's been a big part of my success this year. So, Scotty, thank you for taking the time out of your what seems like crazily busy schedule to chat to us. You've been out training this morning, I believe. How was that? Oh, my gosh. It's 110 degrees today in Los Angeles. And so I tried to go out early, but it is just brutal. (laughs) So hot right now. And um, I'm leaving Wednesday to fly to Italy, and I think it it won't be quite so hot there. No, I don't think you're going to get too much sympathy from European listeners. We've had a miserable summer. You'll get to see that in Italy. Hopefully it will get better for you. But yeah, you're going to the Giro Rosa. What are you expecting from that then? You know, for me, um, I am kind of looking at it as 10 individual stages for opportunities. I don't know that I'll necessarily be a GC rider or that our team will even have a GC rider. If we do and that opportunity uh, presents itself, then I think as a team we'll definitely come together for that goal. But um, there are three teammates in Italy who I haven't even met yet, so I'm looking forward to getting to know them. Um, And then there's two Americans and one Japanese rider that's coming. So um, I do know those girls. And I think all of us will kind of approach it at a day-by-day kind of (laughs) standpoint, look at the stage, see what we can do as a team, and go from there. What kind of racing are you expecting? And and what are your personal individual goals? Uh, I'm expecting it to be pretty competitive just since it's still... Olympic selection for a lot of riders and uh, I'm not personally under that pressure so I'm kind of excited just to go and try my hand at um, at like I said kind of treating it like 10 one day races and kind of hitting the reset button after one day if it didn't go well and just wiping that off the table and starting over if necessary Um, I've only done it one time and that was two years ago, and I loved it. I loved the people, I loved the culture, I love how they support women cycling there. And so, really, I, I guess personal goals, um, I'd love to be a consistent, you know, finisher each day. I don't really have a true sprint, and I'm not really a true climber, but I'm kind of an all-around rider. So I'll be looking just to be consistent from day to day. Scotty, um, as I talk to you I heard a little screech in the background I presume that's one of your twins you've got quite a juggling act going on in your life tell me about that yeah uh, the boys are about to turn five in July and I'm so excited because I'll be home for their birthday just in time Um, but they are very busy and very active (laughs) and um, being a mother has help me with cycling in so many ways. Um, I think cycling is challenging in and of itself, you know, hands down. And then adding the aspect of motherhood on top of that presents an extra challenge. Oh, hang on just a second. Yeah, buddy. (sighs) Motherhood, uh, going back to that, motherhood has um, taught me so much that I've been able to apply to my cycling. It's taught me focus. It's taught me more discipline. It's taught me time management. um, And also just what it means to have the support of a family behind you. And I don't expect other women to understand what it's like to have kids, but I also don't expect them to know how awesome it is at the end of a day to come home and to have the love of your child waiting for you, no matter how well or how poorly you've done. And that's what is really special to me is these guys are my biggest cheerleaders. They're always supportive. They're always excited for me. And Um, you know, one day I'll return the favor when they choose to do what they love. So 
How difficult is it to juggle the two really important jobs of being a mother and a professional cyclist? It is difficult. You know, right now they're approaching school age and I'm thinking, well, how are we going to do that? Because I travel so much. And so my husband and I have been trying to decide if we want to pursue homeschooling. Um, And that's going to be tricky as well. But we decided as a family that we wanted to have the boys as as present as we can through this journey of, um, you know, pursuing cycling as a career. My husband was a professional cyclist as well, and he understands it, you know, up, down, left, and right, what the demands are. And so this past year, we purchased an RV, and (laughs) we've been traveling. Like a big camper van. Yeah, yeah, a big camper. And we've taken the boys to almost every race that's in the continental U.S., This will be the first race that they haven't gone to in Italy, um, and my in-laws are keeping them for us. So um, we've just made a really conscious effort that we want to do it as a family, and um, I think the boys see that, and I think they're going to grow up knowing that they were a big part of their mom achieving a dream, you know? So... That's such an incredible thing to do. Does it make it difficult for you, I guess, to concentrate on the races if you're bringing your family (laughs) along as well? Yeah, there are some days where I want to pull my hair out and (laughs) my teammates will come and say, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out because my boyfriend called. And I'm thinking, girl, you have no (laughs) idea what stress is. So I've got two little people depending on me at the end of every day. And it doesn't matter how tired I am from racing, they still need their mom and so I have to rally that energy for them on a daily basis and um, that has taught me to push myself to new levels in cycling as well and I don't know that I would be as strong of a cyclist if I hadn't learned that from my kids so um, as much as someone could look at it from the outside and say that they've limited my opportunity to recover or to take care of myself they've also given me a boost in that regard of mental strength and the choice to be able to push through hard days you know because we see that actually with some um, elite female athletes that they seem to come back stronger after having children I think of the British mm-hmm. um, marathon runner Joe Peavy Jessica Ennis Hill a heptathlete I mean I know at, on a just normal life basis I feel like a stronger person after having a child do you think that that adds to your sort of mental strength mm-hmm. as well as as a as physical strength really yeah You know what's funny is I actually found cycling a year prior to getting pregnant with the boys. So I didn't have the opportunity to compete as a professional, then choose to have kids, and then continue doing it. I actually turned professional after I had the boys. So I don't have that that retrospective feel of what it was like to race pro without kids. So I don't know any different, and I think that's probably a good thing. (laughs) Um... So the women who have, like for Kristen Armstrong, for example, um, you know, she had a full career with lots of success, chose to have a child, and then continued on with much success later. Um, I, on the other hand, I I mean, our pregnancy was not even planned. My husband and I, surprise, pregnant. And after we um, had the boys, I told him, I I think I still want to pursue cycling. Um, Do you think we can still do it? And he said, absolutely, we'll make it work. And he believed in me when I was, you know, nobody, nothing, um, and just has supported me 100% from day one. So, yeah, yeah, I think I wouldn't be as strong without them. I think I wouldn't push myself as hard as I do because I... I know what they're giving up. They're giving up routine. They're giving up being at home in one place. I mean, there are perks to getting to travel all over the country, but they're also, they're children, so they love normalcy and they like routines, and we take that away from them to bring them to bike races and to expose them to all these new places and people and environments. And so it makes me fight hard knowing that they're giving up something as well. And I push a little harder just because of the support that they're giving me. 
So what is that like for you then as a family, that life on the road? Talk us through the experience, the logistics even of traveling to these races in your RV with your husband and your kids. We literally take one day at a time. Um, I mean, at the beginning of the year, I have a pretty good idea of what races I'm going to attend here in the U.S. So we do know where we're going to be in terms of what weeks the races are, but we just (laughs) fly by the seat of our pants in between. We've done the opposite of the RV, which is take the kids to hotels at races, and that was even harder because you're packing and unpacking suitcases, We had a box full of kitchen materials, like a hot plate and a rice cooker and a coffee press. And we were doing that every other weekend with the kids. And Ernie and I finally just decided, hey, let's just get a home on wheels so we don't have to do that anymore. And so we sold everything we had, got rid of our apartment, and put it all into um, purchasing a mobile home. And we got a pretty nice one so that the boys could have a little space as well to play in there. And... They love it. They call it the home bus. <laughs> so logistically, um, we have just really loved the decision we made. We kind of went on out on a limb. I don't think many young couples with kids choose to do that. And, you know, we're living in 250 square feet, all four of us. <laughs> but it's been a real pleasure this year, and I hope that the kids can remember it when they're a little bit older. I mean, they're only going to be five this year, but I hope they have those memories and just always look back on that fondly. I was wondering what it is about cycling as a sport that attracted you and and made you decide to dedicate your life to it in a way that, that maybe even other sports people, other cyclists haven't really had to do. Okay, so I grew up as a runner and was just plagued with injuries As I was coming into my late teen years, I was planning on running in college competitively, and that did not go as according to plan. I actually had a back surgery and then had shin splints, and it just wasn't going well. So I stepped away from sports altogether, picked up the guitar and painting, and did very liberal artsy things for a few years, and then really missed the competitive aspect of sports but I knew I couldn't run I was just uh, my legs couldn't handle it anymore so I tried triathlon but that still requires you to run so that wasn't working either and finally just decided to cycle and I found my husband at a bike shop (laughs) and he had raced professionally for years and was training for the Ironman at the time being and I I kind of sought him out as the only pro that was in our area at the time and said I really want to try to be a professional cyclist. And he's like, do you even have a bicycle? And I was like, no. <laughs> so he, uh, he actually let me borrow a bike that he had left over, a team bike from one of his pro teams. And we ride the same size anyway. And he set me up and said, okay, I'll coach you if you can hold my wheel for a 40-mile ride. And so he took me out taught me the basics of drafting, and I just loved it and ate it up from day one. I was completely hooked and started doing these crazy long Ironman rides with him. He was doing centuries and stuff like that. And so that summer, I just really got immersed in doing these long rides and decided, hey, I think I want to try racing. And um, the following year, we got pregnant. And so I took a year and a half off. And then in 20, I guess it was 2012, I started back in with doing some criteriums here in the U.S. because I didn't have very much fitness after having the boys. And just started rebuilding my fitness and then um, had some good results and got picked up by the U.S. national team to go to Europe for a few races and then um, picked up by a pro team the following year. So it was really cool what Ernie taught me early on and that was the drafting and the strategy aspect of road racing. I think a lot of women learn it the reverse way which is they get really strong on the bike first and then maybe struggle with um, positioning in a peloton or learning the strategies in and out of racing but he actually taught me the reverse because I had zero fitness at the time and was not able to do these long base training type of rides because the boys were still so young when I came back. And um, so I was really grateful that I kind of learned it backwards in a sense. 
And now that my fitness is coming along, you know, a few years later, I feel like I'm finally reaching the point where I can compete at the level that I'd like to be at. I just, I just wanted to ask one last thing, Scotty. Um, are there any other mothers in the professional peloton that you know of? How unusual or common is your story? Maybe two or three girls that have one child. I don't know anyone that has twins or multiple children, uh, here in the U.S. at least. A cycling podcast, Femina. Interviews, insight and analysis of women's racing. Supported by Rowan King Coaching and Rafa. Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Go to rafa.cc for more information. Oh, what a fascinating story that is, Orla. Yeah, it is. And one of the things that really interested me was I didn't know how many mothers there are in the pro peloton. And Scotty said there really are only a few of them. And if you compare that to the men's, obviously, loads of, of the guys are fathers as well. And that's a much easier juggling act. And it's one thing that has interested me. Why should it be different for women? They're professional cyclists. I, there's less money in it, obviously. Um but I, I guess that's just way, the way we're formatted in some degree. I don't know what our listeners think. It'd be really interested to hear their For, feedback. Formatted. Formatted. Re- formatted. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can be reformatted. I'm yeah. not saying you're stuck for life. Well, I think all the, the professionalism or otherwise of the sport is is a factor too, isn't it? I mean, in, in our last episode, we had an interview with Bob Varney, who runs the Drop Cycling Team, which is unashamedly, proudly an amateur team. Um, and he, he said, you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in, in women's cycling because there's a lot of teams that call themselves professional teams which aren't professional teams there are very few women that earn a a good living Mm. uh, riding their bikes and so there are women competing at a very high level who have to juggle jobs and and other responsibilities too so it's different so it's a bit of a broader base and this is when we were talking about you know the the cycling podcast Femina we were we were saying that you know for a lot of people it's probably easier to relate to some of the world's best female riders Mm. than than some of the than a lot of the the best male riders because the top male riders are all full-time professionals mm. and, and, you know, they live a life that's devoted entirely and exclusively to cycling and they can make an awful lot of money. And Ye- that, that has a, a big a big effect on, on, you know, whether or not you can or how easily you can relate to people. Yeah, absolutely. And what I find interesting about Scotty as well is that they say behind every great man is a great woman. And I think the, the reverse is true in this situation as well, whereby her husband sounds like a like a fantastic support to her. He is her coach as well. Uh, he has agreed to take the kids on the road. It's a family situation. It's a family decision. And it's one that they make together. So, it, you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily be possible if her husband wasn't in support. But it's a fantastically inspirational story. And and just what she has to do on, on a daily, weekly basis is incredible. And like I said, I think she's a real inspiration. Uh, makes me feel rather lazy, I have to say. Especially because you've not even signed up for the Rowan King coaching <laughs> oh, yet. It's the least you can do. Give me a break. <laughs> with all, the, all these energy balls, that energy's got, <laughs> it's got to go somewhere in that weird, weird coffee that you served me earlier. What, where does it all go? It's going into this podcast, Lear, learning Richard. Learning languages. Or, I came to your house today, you've got German radio on. <laughs> yeah. You've got to exercise your mind. It gets lazy otherwise. Odd. Odd. Um, Natürlich. Well, <laughs> listen, uh, we should wrap things up. Uh, but yeah, as, as Orla, I think, said earlier, we're keen to hear any suggestions. You know, we want to cast our net wide and, and tell yeah. lots of different kinds of story, <laughs> stories. Um, so From any about, language. Well, any, well, yeah, absolutely. We can do any, any language at Rich all. Rich is nearly to, there with English. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, we're still working on it. But um, yeah, we're, we're keen to tell lots of different stories. I've got a couple of kind of quite wacky ideas for future episodes, which uh, I've not told you about yet, Orla, but I will at some point. Anyway, should we wrap things up? Let's as, do as that. As I said earlier, we've got lots in next month's episode as well. Hope you enjoyed this month's episode, which will come amid hundreds of thousands of hours and acres and acres of newsprint and broadcast coverage of the Tour de France. So hopefully hmm. it's provided a something a little bit different in the midst of all that yeah hopefully we can pierce all that cloud blanket coverage with a little ray of something different yes absolutely Uh, thank you very much again Orla thank you see you soon okay a little postscript to our second cycling podcast Femina I'm now at the Tour de France uh, and I'm with Felix Mattis who you've come here Felix from the Giro Rosa 
Exactly. I was at the Giro Rosa the whole time for the whole 10 days and then came directly to Montpellier for the for the next stages of the tour. So what happened at the Giro Rosa? Tell us tell us how that unfolded. Who impressed you there? You know the sort of one of the last sort of tests we've got La Course coming up here as well, but one of the last tests before Rio. What tell us what happened? Yeah, I think it's maybe it was the most uh, important test before Rio because of the climbs. Yeah, it was a really uh, interesting race because you had everything sprint stages, climbs, time trial. And actually impressive was how the Americans rode. So uh, Megan Gagne won the race, uh, Evelyn Stevens was second, her teammate, and actually she was the only one who could really battle uh, against Gagne. And Mara Abbott was impressive on, on the Monte Rolo stage. So they are actually the, guy, the, the girls that are to beat at, at, at Rio, I think, in the climbs. Megan Gagne won the, the race overall, but didn't win a stage. Yeah, exactly. Evelyn Stevens took, took three stages, but she uh, had some troubles in the downhill from the Monte Rolo. And uh, the same goes for Abbott. Um, she lost two minutes there when she was four minutes ahead on the on the top of the Monte Rolo, and then lost two minutes in the in the downhill also um, by uh, crashing. So that's that's their weakness. And Megan Gagne didn't lose anything going downhill and didn't lose much going uphill. Only a few seconds in, in the stages that Stevens won. So that's why she won the overall without a stage win. Yeah. Georgia Bronzini won a couple of stages, didn't she? Tiffany Cromwell won a stage, Chloe Hosking, so the wins were shared around, but it was very dominant, again, by Bulls Dolmans. Anna van der Breggen was third. She announced, I think, during the race that she's joining Bulls Dolmans next year, isn't she? Yeah, she is. That was that was actually the very interesting thing, because at the, the first days of the race, she, she was a bit in trouble. She was not really strong enough to, to go with the, with the best uh, there. And then she was she was moving up actually after they announced that she will will go to move, to Bulls as if it there was a blockage in her in her head or something like that and, and as if that was out and then she was climbing better suddenly um, and still went to third place um, was a good race for her at the end but of course not what she what she expected before so a really dominant performance by Bulls Dolmans and they have been dominant all year and yet their world champion Lizzie Armitstead uh, didn't have a great race did she. Yeah, I think she she was there to to help uh, Megan Gagne and, and Evelyn Stevens and did that. So she was always riding at the at the front when when it was needed, and also on the on the very hard uh, mountain stage, not the Monte Rolo stage, the the one on the day after after a four hour transfer actually was uh, uh, was actually the hardest stage with three thousand meters of climbing, four climbs, and there she did a really good job um, to to help uh, Gagne and, and Stevens, but then afterwards she she dropped out. Um, due to sickness I think and and she crashed also on the third third stage I think she crashed and it looked for 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 me it looked first that something was broken because she had a, she held her, her arm as if it was a collarbone uh, thing but at the end it was not bad it was only something with the finger it is it good for the the sport that one team is so dominant and that they're not they're not they're still signing up some of the the, the riders who have been challenging them this year you know I mean is it is is it good for one team to be so dominant I don't think so I, I think it's for the race it's for racing it's never good if one team is, is too strong but everybody said before Wiggle will be the the really dominant team like two years ago when they signed all the riders and um, yeah and actually they didn't end up to be so dominant then Bulls moved up and and they are actually the biggest team now the the most successful team and yeah, it's not good for the racing. Um, it creates some some side stories also that I mean that Stevens and Gagne were actually not openly betting, battling for the for the victory, but you could see they were a bit. So so Stevens rode away from Gagne two times on the climb. Gagne rode away from Stevens when Stevens was in the Maya Rosa on the downhill. So yeah, it was an interesting thing, but still, it's one team, and that's never good. If it's a bit of needle end. I mean, Lizzie Armitage has been saying all year that the Americans will be. The, the team to beat in Rio, a very hilly course, a very talented climbers as the Giro Rosa shows. Who's going to win the Olympic road race? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, if I if I go with a dark horse, I would say Kasia Nivia, or even a Polish uh, Polish uh, woman. Uh, she she had a really good Giro and um, had only one bad day on, on the Monte Rolo day. So that would be my dark horse. But obviously, the big favorites now are Gagne, the, the American team. If they if they stick together and if they really work together, then they are the ones to beat. But that is the thing that I am not sure that will that will be so easy. Um, and then you have Van der Breggen, of course. You have Nivia Doma, you have uh, Gagne, you have Stevens and Armitstedt. 
obviously she, she when she wants and at the Olympics she absolutely wants then she will be also one of the really big favourites there. Brilliant, well Felix thank you very much, we'll, we'll get back to the Tour de France we'll be at La Course uh, in, in, in Paris on the final day of course and that will feature in the third Cycling Podcast Feminine I'll be back with Orla Shinoui for that, thanks for the moment Felix. Thank you, bye Thank you very much to Jonathan Rowe who produced this episode once again thank you to our sponsors Rowan King Coaching and Rafa thank you to Lionel Burney to Daniel Freib to Paul Shafto Steve Fry and everybody else who's been involved in the Cycling Podcast Feminine